Hello and welcome to Mythmakers. Mythmakers is the podcast for fantasy fans and fantasy creatives brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. My name is Julia Golding and I'm the director of the centre and also an author. And today I'm joined by a good friend of the centre, James Nickel, who also teaches on our creative writing courses. But today we thought we would discuss the subject of witches in fantasy. And James, first of all, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your books? Absolutely. I felt like I should cackle when you said witches. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll resist the urge. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is James Nickel. I am an author for children. Um, I write sort of specifically for the middle grade audience, which is kind of depending whether you're in a bookshop or a library or which of those you're in and where in the country you are. It's about sort of seven to 12 year olds or anywhere within that age range. And uh, my first series of books, The Apprentice Witch, uh, were published um, in 2016, 2018 and 2019 um, and feature a young um, witch who has just kind of stopped learning to be a witch and she's off out to do the job of a witch and uh, she kind of messes things up quite royally at the beginning of the first book um, but is mysteriously still given a placement as a witch um, because in the world that my books are set in being a witch is like being a public servant and I'm sure we'll come on to more about that later on so she's sent to this very remote backwater town in the middle of nowhere to be their local witch and they've kind of they've slightly messed up because they've forgotten that Lull which is the town where she's sent to is on the edge of this gigantic magical forest um, which has its own problems um, and it just kind of things just get worse and worse from there really for her <laughs> um, and obviously over the over the series of the books we see her sort of develop from this very unsure young witch into somebody who's very competent with their own power and their own and their own self as well um, and uh, yeah that's kind of and other than that other than being an author I've also been a bookseller for many years um, and I now also work part-time um, in one of our local libraries up here in Yorkshire which is where I live and write these days. Excellent. So James, before we go back to talking about your series and the witch and how witches appear in that, let's do a little bit of um brainstorming about witches, <laughs> obviously they would exist as a character type. So I was the first thing I was thinking of who is my favorite fairy tale witch mm. as opposed to those in novels. So have you got a favorite fairy tale witch? I've got a couple of favorite fairy tale witches actually. I think um I'm really kind of fascinated by uh, the witch in Rapunzel. And I think mm. partly that's because that's a, a story I remember from a very young age um, being read to me. And I grew up in the era of the Ladybird favourite tales that had those very super realistic mm. illustrations in them. So I'm mildly traumatised by them, I think, <laughs> because I and I remember because I, I found some of the images for when I was, getting ready to talk about the apprentice witch and obviously fairy tale which is a, a big influence and and I was shocked by how how much these witches in these fairy tales look like nuns um they kind of they've got these black kind of sort of hooded robes on and yeah just quite scary so thankfully I was never really brought up around nuns because I think I would have been absolutely terrified of them but um beyond that I think it's just she, you know, she's often called Mother Gothel, isn't she, or um, or some a variation on that. And she just seems like a very focused and determined kind of witch, rather than just often in the fairy tales, they they they're almost like a, you know, they they kind of just pop up and do something and then they disappear again. Whereas she is very determined. You know, she's got her 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 own kind of goal set. You know, and that's that's something we're always saying when we're talking about creating characters in, in books when we're teaching on the course about the whole you know making sure your antagonist has a goal and and are as focused as your main character I think you know with Rapunzel the witch in that just seems as though she definitely does have her own story going on rather than the fact that she is just a character in somebody else's tale and I think that's always 
that's always an interesting point to be in and aside from that she's just really horrible isn't she I mean she's pushing people out of windows you know she's locking people in towers for ever and ever and ever and just a real nasty piece of work I think but there is just enough of her own story in it to make her interesting though isn't it because it starts with a sin against her yes Um, you know they she has the garden where she's presumably done the hard work or paid someone to I'm not sure <laughs> oh, I don't know to grow the Rapunzel flower or whatever mm. it is that the lady who's Rapunzel's mother um who wants to you know with her cravings in pregnancy wants yes. to eat. you know it's all very very interesting feminist fe- not feminist feminine themes going on here about the you know the kind of things you might feel during pregnancy and then of course it the the witch herself seems to be childless Mm. So there's the element of you can see why she might want the child which the neighbor next door has got you know it's 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 dark stuff but you can sort of understand where she's coming from uh, which does make her more interesting actually she was the one I was thinking of so I'm going to go for my favorite one of course is the sort of backup who gets a lot of airtime, which is the um the witch in Sleeping Beauty Oh, you know? yes. I mean, she's become a bit of a Maleficent. You know, she's become a sort of character in her own right, thanks to film. She was kind of the other one I thought of, actually. But then I was thinking, oh, she's technically a wicked fairy, isn't she? She's not actually a wicked okay. witch. But then I remember, and you probably know this more than me, because you're, you're much more academic than I am. <laughs> but I seem to remember somebody telling me that if you go back far enough and look at all the origins of the fairy tales often the wicked witches in the fairy tales were wicked fairies and it was only Mm. as you know through history when we you know the general public thought that witches were real that some of those stories obviously started to reflect more what we were experiencing in the real world and and those wicked fairies became wicked witches and I was always fascinated by that because I was like oh you know when you think about it there are lots of witches and not that many fairies in fairy tales so they should probably be called witchy tales not fairy tales at all (laughs) true (laughs) Um, they're all part of folk tales aren't they with Mm. all these these characters I think the thing about the if we're allowing her uh, I think so oh yeah definitely okay um the sleeping uh no the snow white one um, is the it, it, it's a jealousy theme in it, mm. which is very interesting to look at um, because, of course, they all all of these characters are us. It's not as if they are out; they represent different parts of our nature. Yeah, we have these dark drives some somewhere inside us. So we, uh, and she's and she's that one, isn't she? The the, the fear of um, growing old and yes. Um, undesirable and and it all turns in on herself and they take it takes it far too far (laughs) um but actually I did mention though just by mistake um Sleeping Beauty because again that's that goes to your point about the fairies because at the baptism she's the one who isn't invited yes and she's clearly the same as the fairies she's Mm. just the bad one and you can that also plays that thing about you've been left out yeah. So she's really miffed. So <laughs> wasn't invited to the party. So again, she's a, a fairy tale character who can do her own, you know, have her own side in the story. Okay, so that's the ones in fairy tales, which obviously are very much painted in primary colours. That's, that's <laughs> how it works. What about um a bit more subtle, going to your favorite novel witch? And this can be oh. in adult fiction as well as Sure. Yeah, see, this is the difficult, this is the, I've got like a list now. Okay. <laughs> so I was, I, my, my, my gut instinct was The Grand High Witch from The Witches by Roald Dahl, because I just, again, there's just that very delicious wickedness of The Grand High Witch. She's, there's no kind of, you know, it's not grey, is it? She's completely black hearted. Um, you couldn't be confused with thinking that oh she's going to redeem herself in the end you you just know that's never going to happen and I think she is just such a very vivid character um you know Quentin Blake's brilliant illustrations aside I think you can conjure up a picture of of what you imagine she looks like just from from Roald Dahl's world words um but also I remember um as a bookseller I used to often be invited into schools to to do readings and things and 
and I would do anything possible that I could to make sure that I got to read the Grand High Witch's kind of speech when she's telling them all what she's going to do with the children, um, because it's just wonderful. It's just brilliant and delicious. And um, so she was certainly top of my list. And then I was thinking about which is like Mildred Hubble, because I think, you know, without Jill Murphy's brilliant, um, The Worst Witch, Ariane Wynne, The Apprentice Witch, wouldn't have existed at all. Um, and Mildred feels very much like how we all kind of feel, doesn't she, as, as children, and probably as adults quite a lot of the time as well, that you just can't do anything right. Um, and then I was thinking about The White Witch in Narnia, because she, again, is just, you know, just I can't believe and maybe somebody has and I just I'm not aware of it that nobody's ever kind of written a whole book just about the white witch and and kind of her she's ready for an origin story I think isn't she she's ready for a um ready for her kind of story to be told in a way just wonderful well, she, she does get an origin story of a, of a sort it's only like half of it though it's that if you remember in um the magician's nephew yeah. I don't. I see. I have read them all, but I, it's the one I remember the least, and I don't know okay, why. Okay, so just, I skipped. <laughs> just a quick recap. Yeah, um, the children go through these wonderful pools between the worlds, and they fir the first place they go is a, a sort of world at the end of its life called Charn, and um, I think it's one of them rings the bell. Oh, which one is it? it might be Polly. Anyway, somebody <laughs> ring, rings the bell and wakes up. Um, the, this Queen Jadis, as she has been known, and she sort of latches onto them, literally, sort of takes hold of their lug hole and, you know, <laughs> uh, and travels with them as they escape this place and goes first to the sort of Edwardian London, where she then wreaks havoc, um, like taking over, t treating everyone as serfs. It's great. It's really good, actually. Have a enjoy I, reading it again. I remember, remember this very vivid illustration of yeah, her like a strider the, horse and yes. carriage yes like Bodicea but in yeah you know uh, and they have to get get her out of there so they take her back into the ship um the place between the worlds and end up in Narnia so the children bring her into Narnia oh. bringing that element of evil and sort of queenly you know arrogance into the genesis moment of Narnia but going to your point, we don't have the charm story. No. You just know that she's been this terrible um, ruler of this planet that sounds a bit like some kind of Game of Thrones society. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, someone should do that. Yeah. yeah. How did she get to be so mean? I know. And then, and then that got me on to thinking about Elphaba in Wicked, um, which is one of my favourite um, books and you know I really enjoyed the musical though it's very very different um kettle of fish as they often are but and I think that's you know that's that's something that's been done really beautifully isn't it looking at the wicked witch and and completely flipping it around on its axis really and saying you know it's just somebody's point of view that she was wicked and actually when you look at the the story in wicked that's you understand completely and you're kind of there gunning for her and hoping that she succeeds in what she's trying to do um and you feel quite sad when Dorothy throws that bucket of water over her <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you definitely spoiler spoiler <laughs> yeah. yeah that's right uh I think I'm with you on the definitely on the Narnia um because that's the witch I think of you know when someone says but then I have to also say Oh, okay. So there's a lot of witches in Harry Potter too, but they don't yeah. feel very much like witches. They feel more like student, student ma magicians. Yeah. Uh, it's just that the terminology says they're witches. But if we're allowing the Harry Potter world, my favourite witch amongst all of them is Dolores Umbridge, because Ooh. she's so awful in a different kind of way. Whereas um, Bellatrix um, Strange is like witchy witch. Yes. Dolores Umbridge is your process orientated political witch which i think yeah. is quite a nice uh variation on a theme but all of these um take us back to your own writing about witches because we've obviously got this you're, you've got some stereotypes out there which have become quite um problematic in some ways about the demonization of women power. women's power and all that kind of thing 
So when you are writing about witches, what are your sort of choices that you're making and how you're defining what your witches are? I think there was there was there's so much, isn't there, when you start to look at, at witches in, in fairy stories and novels and films and everything, you there is just so, so much that kind of comes flying at you, pun intended. And and it is about kind of picking and choosing quite carefully. And and I was very aware that you know, I was writing a book about a witch that flies on a broomstick and and a little bit in the back of my head I kept having sort of fear of, of Harry Potter comparison. Um, but to a certain extent you, I sort of had to just set that aside because I think if, if I'd worried about it too much I would have never have written the books. And also a, a bit, you know, I I wrote The Apprentice, which really is a as a practice to see if I could finish a whole novel. I'd started another fantasy book for children and I'd I'd got so far with it and I then it would just I would get stuck. So after an, an a um creative writing course, I leapt into the Apprentice Witch and and I kind of I liked making those decisions and thinking, okay, so how is she going to what is the magic going to be like in this world how are they going to control the magic and and I I kind of discounted wands very quickly because I think they are so cemented in the world of Harry Potter these days Mm. that it just it didn't seem like the right thing and I quite liked the idea for a while that she would have a, a cauldron like a small cauldron and that she would have to brew her magic in this cauldron but then I I was thinking well practically speaking (laughs) my practical brain kicking in by the time she's got this potion bubbling and boiling away, whatever she's trying to protect herself or other people against is probably going to be chewing both of her legs off, isn't it? So the the cauldron thing, whilst I thought it was a lovely idea, just didn't seem practical enough. And then I was thinking about symbols and, and obviously symbology and witchcraft are very closely linked. But And I think that is the point where it becomes you know, where, where people might think, oh, well, how are you going to overcome that? And I remember um, when I was, when I eventually worked out the glyphs that, that are, are what they use in the in the stories, these magical symbols, um, I had this gorgeous notebook. It's not anywhere to hand to show you, but it's just a small little leather bound notebook that somebody gave me as a gift. And it was one of those things, it was, it was too small to use in in sort of any real practical way but it was too nice just to use for kind of like making shopping lists or notes in a meeting and so it just sat on my bookcase forever anyway in the end I doodled all of these glyphs in this book which then kind of became the inspiration for the second book but when I had a meeting with with Barry Cunningham my publisher fairly early on and I showed him this book that had the glyphs in it he flicked through it all really really quickly and when he got through he closed it and he, and he sort of sighed with relief and I said oh what what's the matter and he said I was just checking there weren't any pentagrams in there <laughs> I think he was quite worried so I, I I kind of used that idea of the symbols but completely went in the opposite direction I was looking for inspiration at, at kind of you know um, Chinese and Japanese um, characters um, other kind of made up languages like Elvish or um, Vulcan um, all sorts of things and in the end I made up my own because I just couldn't find what I was looking for and it was um, very quickly a um, a mixture of musical notes and numbers my little person has woken up so we just had a little break because um, James's baby woke up. So if anyone hears any strange noises, it's a, a baby happy, happily being cuddled. Yeah, um, it's not my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking about um, the witches in your world and, and what they do. I'm interested in this idea that they're like a kind of civil service or a sort of local representative. What is their job? What is what are they needed for? So um, magic is something that everybody has to deal with in that world. It's it's kind of almost the the flip opposite of Harry Potter, where it all happens in secret and in hidden places. Magic happens out in the open and everybody has to deal with it, regardless of whether they have the ability to ah. actually do something or, or whether they're just, you know, a, a non-magical person. And so the witches can control the magic and they are then given positions of responsibility within communities 
to help people. So it could be a magical infestation that you have in your house, um, which is one of the problems that Ariane Wynn encounters fairly early on in the book. Or it could be as simple as making a magical charm for somebody for, for whatever they need it for. So when she first arrives in Lull, the mayor has issued everybody with a with an, an out of date for a start magical charm. Um, but he doesn't know anything about magic, and he's actually given given them the charms that a farmer would use to protect himself from a marauding herd of cows. Um, oh, getting you need to go back to sleep. Shh. Um, yeah, so it's kind of those are the sort of the the two examples of the types of magic that the witches um, get involved with. Somebody once described it as a cross between um, call the midwife and the worst witch. <laughs> and <laughs> my my agent says it's more like all creatures great and small crossed yes. with the worst witch um, because of the there's an awful lot of magical creatures um, that feature in the story as well. So. Um, yeah, it's kind of it's a it's a mishmash, but they are there as a you know in the in the way that you would go and see a, a GP or a dentist or you know a bit like the local librarian or the vicar or a teacher. They're kind of you know people within the community that others turn to and and expect a lot from and and look up to hopefully as well. Um, yeah, that was kind of the 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 sort of the the thing that I wanted to do that would be would be different because often with with magical stories you find that the main character quite early on is discovers that they have a magical power mm. and then it's about them learning to use it and I thought well there's lots of brilliant books that already do that and I wasn't interested in trying to retread that ground I wanted to know what happened after they'd learned how to use their magical ability so I knew that it was going to be about somebody doing the work of a witch but as you quite rightly asked what is the job of a witch and it took me a while to to work that one out myself but that was part of the fun as well was discovering that for myself and I think this goes back to where we were talking about the one of the problems about writing about witches is the fact that they've been this um anti-female stock figure on the edges of society and you know the sort of I the thought was that very often it was the old woman who grew herbs and made a little oh, bit of yeah. um a living as a sort of natural healer who then got picked on as a witch because they could and then you get things like the Salem witch trials and all that mm. kind of thing where it's used to settle scores so one way of handling all of that is I is what you've done is to put the, the witches as part of society yeah part of the community your local vet um yeah no I, I can see that that really helps draw the sting that mm. is in the the idea of a witch and I I grew up in Norfolk which you know like lots of East Anglia is kind of rife with stories and legends of witches and I can remember one particularly um King's Inn where I where I lived there's a building in the market square and above the central window, there's a black diamond. And in the black diamond, there's a black heart. And it's called the witch's heart. And there's a legend about this woman who was burnt. Uh, well, she was actually boiled in oil in the market square. She was called Margaret Reed. And um, as she was bubbling away in this cauldron, her heart allegedly burst out of her chest, flew across the marketplace and hit this building, which was the house where the people who'd accused her of being a witch lived. Um, and... I don't know who told me that story. It's one of those things that I seem to have known my whole life. And if you ask anybody from King's Inn the story of the witch's heart, they'll tell you something similar, if not identical to that story. The witch's name might be slightly different. Um, the method of her dispatch might be slightly different, but it always ends up with that heart flying across the marketplace, which is, you know, it's a very visual thing to have implanted in your brain at a very... I'm assuming young age um but I knew like you were saying that there's a lot of the what we do know about those people who were accused of witchcraft historically were they were healers and midwives and and you know they were they were trying to help people so it was you know without wanting to kind of think that I was going back and writing old wrongs that wasn't it at all but it was kind of what would have happened if if the reverse had been 
the truth and they had been celebrated and and encouraged rather than picked on and persecuted. I think Terry Pratchett has a good line on this, which I'm going to slightly misquote, but it's something like, you know, the, the wizards get to do the sort of, you know, serious high magic and witches get to give you warts. And <laughs> it talks a lot about the sort of glass ceiling in magic, um, which I think there's a lot that has been done to try and rectify that. But you still get it coming in, don't you? Um, yeah. I was looking, thinking about the Witcher series, obviously a different kind of <laughs> Witcher isn't a witch, but um, the witches in the Witcher they the very first one of them jennifer jennifer she's this sort of ugly old <laughs> ugly girl who gets this be beautifying spell and that i found that that worries me uh, that that's <laughs> where that story starts she turns into a really yeah. good character and an interesting character but this point of her magic makes you beautiful and desirable sexualized object i find quite worrying and um problematic anyway we're not in that world it's, it's <laughs> going on in in terms of the archetypes of um what witchcraft is about yeah and i did i think when i was when i was thinking about my story when i started to write the apprentice which and i i was thinking well i want it to be a story that has magic in it and who's the best person to control magic and i thought well a, a witch just seemed like the natural person to pick without mm. overthinking it too much at that point I'm sure there was lots of overthinking later on. Um, but it it seemed to me that, you know, as somebody who's always read a lot of children's books and, and kind of existed in that world, um, that even then, and this would have been 2012, so we're talking, you know, a while ago now, 10 years, in fact, um, that there was still, even in, in the books then, the witches were the warty old lady who curses people or was somebody's sidekick there weren't there weren't that many witch witches who were heroes in their own stories um and even poor old Hermione is only the sidekick she's not the main character in the Harry Potter books although she's a main character mm. um she was still only you know there to do all the brainy stuff for him <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's another discussion, really, about you as a bookseller as to whether or not Harry Potter, the Hermione Granger series. I was always told as a writer that boys tend not to read books with girls. As a mm, that is interesting because I would say, from my experience at doing events and selling books, you know, of my own books when I'm doing school visits and things, I'd say it's often fifty fifty that I sell books to as many boys as I do to girls. Um, and I think part of that's largely down to the lovely covers that are on the books in that they're silhouettes and they're not overly... Not pink. And they're sparkly. not pink. One of them was very nearly pink and I, it was one of those kind of, you know, disappointed Christmas present faces when you're sort of like, oh, it's lovely. Um, and inside you die a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully it got changed to yellow um, before it was published. So that was a, a big relief. Um, yes, but I think that's that's part of the, the, the thing that's made it not accessible, but not it hasn't put boy readers off. Um, and perhaps the fact that I'm not a girl. Um, might have helped as well I don't know but I get lots of lovely messages from parents you know that are like oh my son's you know my son met you at school or my son's picked your book up um and that's always really that's really nice because I didn't expect it you know I, I wrote a book with a, a female a largely female cast the boys <laughs> one of my one of my best reviews ever was from a young reader a young girl and um she gave me nine golden balls out of ten for, okay. my, for the book and I would have got 10 golden balls if there hadn't been any boys in it because boys <laughs> are stupid apparently right. um and so yeah and the, and largely in The Apprentice which the boy characters except for Colin they are rather stupid okay <laughs> <laughs> so we've we've sort of been talking a bit about the the problem about witchcraft when it comes to the sort of the way it's been used against women uh, yes. over the centuries. But there, we haven't really talked about the association with evil because why, you know, where witchcraft in the sort of Halloween sense comes from is that it's to do with the whole idea of black magic, 
evil in some story worlds it's to do with sort of the devil and religion and that sort of thing too and you know there's a witch in the bible uh witch of endor and things like that um what do you do with evil in your world how do you deal with that side i'm, I'm thinking here that you know there was um you know the well publicized cases of people not reading harry potter uh i don't know how true this is but trying to ban it from libraries in america because it dealt with witchcraft which was seen mm. as anti-christian um anyway all that stuff w what have you done with evil okay. <laughs> <laughs> i put it in a nice little box and hidden it um no i haven't because i think you know well Personally speaking, and, and experience from people that, you know, I know, thankfully, very few of us ever really experienced true evil in our lives on a personal, you know, to, to deal with. And so I didn't feel that there needed to be. I mean, there are wicked characters in the story, obviously, and there are bad things that happen. But I think on the scale of of that we all have bad things that happen to us and we all meet characters that we don't much like in life and that aren't very pleasant, but those characters aren't actually truly evil. So most of the bad characters in the story aren't pure evil. And also I think pure evil, it kind of, it feels a bit twirly moustache and tying you to the train tracks, doesn't it? <laughs> doesn't feel, yeah. doesn't feel um, real in a way that I wanted the you know the characters to deal with real real in a fantasy world kind of experiences so I've made the the things that Ariane Wynn and her friends have to deal with to be the sorts of things that we all have to deal with like you know overbearing um older people or bullies or um you know overcoming their own doubts and worries and, and fears so it's I haven't tried to kind of pretend that evil doesn't exist but I kind of tried to to make it feel more realistic in an odd way because it's a fantasy book so it's never going to be realistic um but not not just to be oh they did it because they were evil um because that just feels like a bit of a cop out in a way um but as i said i mean there are some pretty wicked people in the books later on um the people that are kind of pulling all the strings but not yeah there's you know the reasons behind it and it's not just oh because they're because they're evil um so yeah does that answer the question yeah i think what it's what you're describing is the fact that one of the things you learn when you write fantasy is there are various forms of worlds so the problem about that harry potter must be banned because it's got witches in thing is that within the laws of the harry potter universe there isn't a religious level in it there isn't a sort of demon side there is good and evil but it doesn't have a supernatural I mean, supernatural ghosts and things but it's all within a sort of bubble which is the fight between good and evil and a redefinition of witches and wizards within that world so in your world you've you've got uh a a sense of good and bad which is recognizable you're not mm. tapping into some sort of narrative of raising demons and no. summoning the devil which is a, a, a folkloric version of this but it's not in your world so when you say witch you aren't saying that kind of witch but no. some people don't listen to the sort of new one. <laughs> and so you get a sort of knee-jerk reaction which i hope you yeah. don't get but um no i mean very I've been surprised. I was invited to a, a Catholic prep school on um, Ash Wednesday to do a whole day of creative writing sessions and, and talk about The Apprentice Witch. And I was thinking, do they know it's got a witch in the book? I mean, well, obviously, I, I know that it's not that sort of witch, but um, it was it, there was no problem. But I did. I, somebody did tell me once that they had bought copies for their local. I think it was either their local school or a school where a family member taught or a child went to and they refused to have it because of it having witch in the title and I was flabbergasted to find out it was a Church of England school. <laughs> yeah. Those of you listening over, overseas, be. Church of England is very mild, it's, it's yes. not a sort of, um, um, that, that must be just a local issue. I think so and I just and, and in a way I was kind of excited that I'd kind of you know I'd sort of been banned a little bit, I kind of 
I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you could probably get a bit more social media play from that, but then it takes you into, you know, yeah. deep waters, all of that, doesn't it? I mean, it's not to, the thing is, it's just, it's not that anybody's downplaying the nature of evil. It's no. just, in my world, how I'm using this, it doesn't, doesn't hit those points that you're making. So what you're accusing me of doing with is not, it's just, I'm not there in at your particular version of a witch. And, yeah. that, and that's the difficult conversation to have. Mm. Um, anyway, so thank you. That's that's all. That's really interesting. So we always finish our podcast by thinking of where in all the fantasy world is the best place to be something. And of course, I want to ask you now, where in all the fantasy worlds that you've read about, where would you think it would be the best place to be a witch? Well, again, I was kind of torn between a few places. So, I mean, I did, I was kind of strongly drawn towards the world of Harry Potter because obviously that's a very, you know, a sort of very mostly welcoming and all encompassing place to be a witch. But it's also still a place where they live in, in secret. Um, and again, I thought again of, of the world of the worst witch. Do we all really want to be stuck at school for the rest of our lives? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Um, depending on your experience of school, you might be quite happy. It's like when people say, oh, I'd love to go back and be a teenager again and go back to high school. And I can't think of anything worse. Um, but then I was drawn to um, Alice Hoffman's Practical Magic series, um, which is it's the real world. But the witches have kind of lived through all of the turmoil of being witches, you know, from they've had kind of a brush with the Salem witch trials and they've, they've, you know, they've, they've existed and survived through those, through those periods and, and, and in a wonderful kind of way that this family has just embraced their abilities as witches. And, and I kind of like that, that kind of feeling. Yes, I, I've had the um, same Harry Potter thought as you. The thing that actually I often think about that is, have you noticed how magic never runs out? It's like it's yes. a resource. They can just keep on doing spells. As long as you know the spell and do it right, you know, Wingardium Leviosa or whatever it is, not yeah. Leviosa. <laughs> if, as long as you get that right, um you just you can just keep on doing magic, which I, I feel as though if I was inventing a magic world, I might have a budget so it doesn't feel as though <laughs> you could just keep on doing it. So from that point of view, you could just carry on doing magic all the time. And so it sounds quite a and you've got all the it's quite cozy when you're not being attacked by Lord Voldemort, you know. Yes. Um it's got books and friends and pets and food and you know steam trains so yeah i think i'd go for that world um <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd be some obscure witch though i wouldn't want to be one of the ones you know, <laughs> all the time that doesn't sound very much fun no i'm not great at camping so i would <laughs> you know the thing yeah but the their, their camping always looked really lovely didn't it it's like <laughs> i would i would go camping if my tent had like a separate bathroom and kitchen True. and living room in it <laughs> yeah actually now i think about it wasn't the weasley tent a little bit down market so probably you could you know spend and get uh you know it was yeah it was a tap and... i think it still looked nicer than the house that they lived in <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway the inconsistencies there we go you know um, why put up a marquee for the wedding when you could just put up a tent and magic lots of rooms but anyway let's not worry about that um so thank you very much james you're very um, welcome I, is is your series now complete or is there more books to come we always say it's complete for now just because uh -huh. I think you know that when you've written three books and and written the characters in the world you can always think of more things that you might like to do with them or do to them um and yeah so I'm not I'm not saying no I'm not saying yes either really I don't suppose um Obviously, they're they're in very early stages of development for TV at the moment, so that's that's going to bring a different life to them. Um, and if that, you know, if that 
means that it brings new readers, which hopefully it will, that's exciting and that might mean that people want to read more. Um, but that's not what I'm working on at the moment. The next book that's coming is, is something still magic, still middle grade, but different, not Apprentice Witch. Um, but I hope it'll still appeal to fans and I hope soon I can tell everybody what it's called. <laughs> Because I feel like I've been waiting forever. Yes, to watch this thing. <laughs> yeah, and if, you, uh, if, if you're listening and you want to uh, join James and me and the other tutors on one of our fantasy writing courses, the next one sets off in April. So do sign up. Uh, it's already filling up. So it'd be good to, uh, if you wanted to grab a place, that you grab it now. Thank you very much, James. And well done to Baby, uh, Baby Little, <laughs> for actually managing to quieten down and have a little listen. As she's you... gone back to sleep. Excellent. She's got all these stories waiting for her when she grows <laughs> up. Okay. Thank you very much, James. Thanks and a lot. Bye. Thanks for listening to Myth Makers Podcast. Brought to you by the Oxford Centre for Fantasy. Visit OxfordCentreForFantasy.org to join in the fun. Find out about our online courses, in-person stays in Oxford, plus visit our shop for great gifts. Tell a friend and subscribe wherever you find your favourite podcasts worldwide. Worldwide.